Sometimes when people think about the word accelerate, um, they, they think about things moving faster. You know, I looked up the meaning of accelerate in, in, in the dictionary just so that we can be, be clear what it means. And, and I, will need, I will need help with the slides. So is, are we going to put it up? Okay. Otherwise, I might have to forget the fact that I have slides. Eh? All right. Okay. So when I checked the meaning of accelerate, it meant to speed up, to go faster, and to increase in speed. And, and that's something that everybody probably knows. That when you talk about acceleration, you're not really talking about a shortcut. You're talking about covering the distance that you should have covered but in shorter time because you were able to do something that helped you to move faster, to gain speed, and to cover ground in a shorter period of time. And when you think about the fact that we are in the last days, I think that the word accelerate may begin to make more sense to you. And I'm hoping that over the next few minutes, I will be able to share with you even greater reason why God needs you to accelerate. Now, I know that there is a place where the Lord accelerates man, and we saw this in the, in the case of Philip, for instance, where all of a sudden Philip started to run, and he started to literally run at the pace of a chariot that was moving. And God actually said to Philip in Acts chapter 8, I believe, that go and overtake him. Now, so for those of you who thought that uh, Elijah was, uh, was, was a strange man, that happened in, in, in the Old Testament. Please understand, in the New Testament, it is still possible for men to outrun chariots. And if it happened in the Old Testament and the New Testament, then I want you to understand that in the Now Testament, it can happen also. And I'm not asking you to outrun a bus on the road. I'm not asking you to outrun a motorbike or any of those things. I mean, our own chariots are different, but possibly understand that many times chariots are the things that have come by systems that have been built by human intervention. And when you begin to look for systems that have been built by human intervention, it is possible for you to outpace those systems. Uh, right, right. I had the privilege of working in a place called Philips Consulting between the years of 1998 and the year 2000. And when I was going to join Philips Consulting in the year 1998, in April, um, I remember that they, they told me that I needed to start my career as a, an associate consultant. Even though I had just finished my MBA, and they said to me, well, because you have not practiced with your MBA, uh, our structure does not allow you to come in at higher than associate consultant. And I said to the lady who was interviewing me at that time, Mrs. Titi Akisoya, I said to her, but, but uh, this, I, I don't know what your structure says, but when I look at how much they were offering me, which was 13,000 naira per month, I said to her respectfully, I said, ma'am, I am worth more than that. And she said something to me that changed my life. She said to me, prove it. Tell somebody, prove it. Uh, I, I, those were the words that formed the basis for everything that I'm still doing today. She said, after prove it, she said, prove your worth. The moment she said that, she gave a promise and said, whatever you are worth, I will match it as you prove it. Now that opened the windows of heaven for me. Ladies and gentlemen, in 14 months, I was promoted four times. My salary went from 13,000 naira to 130,000 naira in 16 months. It is said, I don't know whether anybody has beaten that record till date, but it is said that in Philips Consulting, no one had ever risen that fast. And, and the point being that the career pace was a, was a structure, was a chariot set by man. But when the hand of God comes upon you, right, you can get to a point where, for instance, even though I was not a managing consultant yet, 
there was a meeting that used to be called Managing Consultants Meeting every Monday because Managing Consultants were group heads. But they had to change the name of the meeting to Group Heads Meeting to be able to accommodate me because I was managing a group that was one of the most profitable groups in Philips Consulting called the Customer Service Group. And since I was not a managing consultant yet, they couldn't call it a managing consultant meeting because I shouldn't have fit in. So they changed the name of the structure to include me. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say. Oh no, somebody is still not getting my point here. Listen to me, many times we Christians are of the belief that it is unfair for us to be favored. Even when we are favored, we begin to grumble. We don't, you, you know, and Christians are the first to be able to say it is not fair. Then, well, God said do not fear. Me. <laughs> Forget whether it's F-A-I-R or F-E-A-R. Fair is not in the game. What is the point of being a Christian if you have no advantage? Tell me. Why bother? Because without advantage and without acceleration, without the power of God, God is a concept. That's what he's reduced to. The Bible is reduced to a history book and maybe at best a literature book. We need to understand that as Christians, we have advantage. Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go to my father in heaven so that I can send you the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, I have the advantage. This is such an important thing that we need to understand. I looked up the word accelerate and it said, to cause something to happen sooner or more quickly. There are things in your life that need to happen to you, but more importantly, they need to happen quickly so you can enjoy them for longer. What is the point in you finally driving your Ferrari at the age of 68? Just the sound of the engine will give you a cardiac arrest. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say. It's not that it is not in your lineage or in your destiny path to enjoy certain things, but it is, in, it is better for you to enjoy them while you are young. Don't you understand? They don't make beautiful shoes for old people. They make comfortable shoes for them. So if that is when you now finally hammer, like Cornel Sanders, who set up a global business at 64. 64? 64! Ha! Ha! <laughs> what could he enjoy again? He set up KFC at 64. The business did not even hammer for almost 11 years. So by the time Colonel Sanders was beginning to enjoy the work of his business, KFC, he was already 75. Don't eat no oil, no sugar, no pepper, no... What do you want to eat when you are... I mean, even he, could eat, he couldn't eat his own KFC. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. Tell somebody you got to make it quickly. And, and let's be clear, let's be clear. I'm not asking you to take a shortcut. I'm asking you to do what you have to do as quickly as you need to do it. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? There is nothing absolutely wrong with accelerating. There is nothing. Can you please just quickly share with me what I have here? Right? And one of the places that you will see the power of acceleration the most I think is in the Formula One race. It's one of those things that I enjoy very much with my son, my middle son, Demilade, um, who just loves speed. I mean, he's, he's just a speedy Gonzalez. Demilade can't walk. He only runs. Right? He, he runs. He, he, he grew up crawling and running. The guy loves anything that is speed. Power bikes, you know, motor cars, and he's the one that is always telling me, Daddy, somebody just overtook us. On the road when we're, you know, you know, he just, he reminds you of everybody that has, oh, another one has just gone by. Oh my God, and then there's another one. Well, oh, thank you, Father. Father, thank you. We finally overtook one car. You know, I mean, that's the kind of, that's the discussion we have in the car when he's with me. Demi Lade loves, he totally just loves Formula One. And when you look at Formula One, I mean, Formula One is amazing. Just the aerodynamics, the engineering, the technology that goes into Formula One is, is masterpiece. I mean, Take, for instance, this is a steering wheel in Formula One. This is what, if, but if you even thought this was bad, check this one out. 
All right? This is what the Ferrari steering wheel looks like. Okay? And you can see that it's an engine. It even has, if you look at it clearly, you will see Intel inside. That's not even, let me show you another one that just will blow your mind. Look, look at this. Okay, move back. This is the tr evolution of how steering wheels have grown in the, in the Formula One technology. Technology is everything in Formula One. This is one of those places. And, well, on this particular day in, in May, um, March 2013, we were watching this particular race. It was a Chinese Grand Prix race. And let me put it this way so you get it. There are usually four guys who are called the usual suspects to take the pole. The pole is position one, two, and three. So there are, uh, there are four guys that are almost certain to almost be on the, on the pole. Of course, there are surprises, as you know, with Formula Ones. Even when you drive well, somebody else can come and hit you. All right? But these four guys are supposedly the gurus. I mean, Fernando Alonso, who drives uh, for Ferrari. Kim Raikkonen, who drives for Lotus. Um, my son's personal favorite. Um, Lewis Hamilton, who used to drive for, for Mercedes at that time, and of course, the world's greatest Formula One driver right now, Sebastian Vettel, who drives for Red Bull. And these were the four guys that were going to go on the Chinese Grand Prix. And, and essentially, this was going to be a 56 lap race. I mean, these guys were going, let's go, let's go, let's go. These guys were going as fast as 320 kilometers per hour. And this was how they took off. Everybody took off on the same level. Somebody say, somebody say, say with me, same level. Uh, everybody took off on the same level. But after an hour and 36 or so minutes, we started to see that levels have changed. Oh, you didn't hear what I'm saying. Now, now by the time they came in, the four usual suspects were the guys in front of the game. And so you see Fernando Alonso winning the match or the game with 1 hour 36 minutes 26.945 seconds. Coming very closely behind was Kim Raikkonen who had 1 hour 36 minutes and 37 seconds. And you can see that's really just about 11 seconds. Does anybody want to know what 11 seconds looks like in Formula 1? You want to know? Can I show you? Okay, this is what 11 seconds looks like in Formula 1. This is Sebastian Vettel crossing, sorry, this is um, Fernando Alonso crossing the finish line. Can you see how far back? Can you see where Kim Raikkonen is? Can you see Kim Raikkonen? Exactly. That's the distance that 11 seconds has in Formula 1 race. Almost a kilometer. And yet, to think that they started together. But that's not the big deal. Go to the next slide, please. You will see the three of them are there, and one person is missing. And who is that person? Sebastian Vettel. The best and greatest Formula One racer. Right? He's missing from the podium. Why? Let's go to the next thing. Look at it. This was why Sebastian Vettel did not make it to the podium. Okay, because Lewis, go back please. Lewis Hamilton came at 1 hour, 36 minutes and 39 seconds. Oh, sorry. Sebastian Vettel also came in at 1 hour, 36 minutes and 39 seconds. Oh, well. Well, Kim, Lewis Hamilton came in at 1 hour, 36 minutes. 39.267 seconds. Sebastian Vettel came in at 1 hour, 36 minutes, 39.470 seconds. In a sense, Sebastian Vettel, the greatest Formula 1 racer, who's won more matches, especially, I think he won seven Formula 1 titles last, last season. This guy, eight, yeah? This guy lost out of being on the podium for less than point one seconds. I don't know whether anybody understands what I'm saying. This is the kind of thing that happens when time becomes crucial. And you see, for us that live in the mere mortal world, 
of driving on Lekki Expressway. We don't understand the difference that one second can make. In fact, most of us don't understand the difference that one minute can make. In fact, to be honest with you, many of us don't even know the power of an hour. Sometimes we don't even know when one day has gone. Has it ever occurred to anybody, anybody here, you thought it was Monday and it was Tuesday? So that's a whole day. In Formula One race, that is three lifetimes. I don't know whether you get what I'm trying to say. Let's go. What I would love you to imagine is, can you think, I mean, generally it takes about something in the region of about 40 people that work on a Formula One race, okay? The guys that are the engineers, the guys that fix the tires, something in the region of about 40 people. Can you imagine how each one of them must have felt at night going to bed, wondering whether they were the ones that was 1.1 1. 1 or 0. 0.2 seconds late, that maybe I could have just changed that flat tire faster, one second faster. And just because I didn't change that tire fast enough, then we lost out on everything. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, maybe it was just Sebastian Vettel that was thinking, maybe I could have pressed that accelerator one second faster. Ask the person next to you, what can you do faster? They say today in this dimension of, of, of the microwave, time is the next dimension of quality. That after it is good, the only way it gets better is to do it shorter. Ladies and gentlemen, acceleration is such a critical thing in our time today. Accelerate is also defined as to cause faster or greater activity, development or progress or advancement. To cause greater activity that leads to faster, greater development, faster, greater progress, faster, greater advancement. And if we are going to enter, into, I mean, as we are in the month of, of, of accelerate, especially in, in, in the Elevation Church, we have to understand that there is a grace of God that is upon us to be able to cause us to do things faster that will create development, progress, or advancement. I think there's a, a perfect example for me that helps you to see just what human beings can do. And this particular example is, for me, it's very interesting because I always say that this example was created with an also blessing. Maybe somebody doesn't know what the also blessing is, so I would let you know. Because God said to Ishmael, or to Abraham, sorry, I will bless Ishmael also. It wasn't the original blessing, it was the appendix blessing. It was the Jara blessing, it was the attachment blessing. I don't know whether you understand. This wasn't the real stuff, because it was said concerning Isaac, that Abraham gave all to Isaac. He gave what? He gave what? After all, what is left? Well, with the nothing that he gave to Ishmael and his brothers, they have done this. All right? This is a picture that was taken from an angle shot in 1990. And then from the same angle shot, a picture was taken again 13 years later. In 2003. And ladies and gentlemen... What you see there is no joke. It's not Photoshop. It is real. Brick, mortar, systems, and governance. Let me put it in another way so that you can see it. This was what it looked like. That building that you see there was the tallest building in this city, or this, 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 this city, as it were, mini nation. And in just 13 years, that building, which is the Dubai World Trade Center, 38 stories high, has been dwarfed in 13 years. And I'm asking you, where were all these buildings 13 years ago? If anybody told you that, what do you call this, an improvement or a transformation? That this could happen in 13 years, would you have believed it? This is what you call national acceleration. This is when a nation engages the power 
to accelerate, the grace to accelerate and puts it to work. And it's interesting. Let me just show you something. For many years, the nation was on go slow, led by another man. But then there was another gentleman who came in, Sheikh bin Mohammed bin Rashid al Maktoum, who had a different thinking to the ones of his predecessors. And this guy wrote a book that I, I commend to every single person here. Please write the name of this book down if you don't have it. It's called The Race, it's called My Vision, Race to Excellence. My Vision, Race to Excellence. If you have not read that book, you haven't yet read a leadership book. This, for me, is the greatest leadership book only next to the Bible. For me, the Bible is the greatest leadership book ever. Okay? And so, my vision, in that book, Sheikh Mohammed begins to tell you about the importance of speed. And you can see that whatever happened in Dubai didn't happen by chance. That it was the result, literally the natural result of a supernatural thinking. If you see that book, it will, I mean, let me leave it, don't let me spoil it for you. Right? My children always say, D -d 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 please don't spoil it. When you want to tell somebody what they haven't enjoyed yet. But the point that I'm trying to make is, I beg of you, let every one of you, I mean, and I'm sure Pastor Godman, if, have you read the book, sir? We have it here. Okay? Is there anybody that has not read the book? Okay, now you understand, listen to me, listen to me. We have come into the era and the season where the knowledge, where knowledge covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. The only way you can be ignorant in these days is for you to do the first six letters of the word ignorant, ignore. Because whatever knowledge you are seeking is around you. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. Tell somebody next to you, go get that book. Okay, let's move, let's move quickly, please. Let's move quickly. I need the slides. Just take a look at, at this picture. One picture was taken in 1989. The other was taken in 2000. Sorry, they're about three, 30 years apart, right? And if you look at it, you know, look at the skyline. Can you see the skyline? Look at the skyline on the left side and then the one on the right side. Isn't that amazing? Is that improvement or transformation? Let's go quickly. They built 40-story buildings, 40 blocks of buildings 54 stories high in just about 10 months in Dubai. And they concluded the first, the 40th one within three days of finishing the first one. All right? So in a sense, you would see that whilst the building was still going and they were putting newer decks on it, they had already started painting. And you can see that when you look at it, can you see the painting? They were painting as they were going. But that's not all. Look at the, at the bottom. Can you see fresh paint on it? So that's the second layer of paint on a building that they're still building. At one point in time, 15% of all the world's cranes were in Dubai. 15%. All the world's cranes. So it didn't happen by chance. And they work night and day. The only day they don't work is on Friday. But in Dubai, there are four shifts. One shift meets the other. I don't know whether you understand. So even at night, let's go. This is what it looks like, the same building. There is no time that they're not working on something. The ruler of Dubai has a very simple concept. Very simple. He says if it will take six months for 1,000 men to get a job done, then it will take them one month if you, dub, if you made it 6,000 people on it. And if 6,000 people worked on it and then they concluded it in one month, they can start enjoying whatever their work was in the second month. And so that, the, the, in a sense, you can start reaping the benefits of your investment by the second month and then you open up the economy for those 6,000 people to get another job. Instead of doing one Lekki Express Road for four years. <laughs> Let's go. Look at this. This is the Dubai Creek. And this is 1979 to 2010. All right? Look at the difference. Can you see it? Somebody say accelerate. 
No, 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 no. I told you that you guys were too cool. Come on, say with me, accelerate. accelerate. This is what Na Dubai Airport looked like in 1960. What's that magic word we've just used again? Accelerate. Somebody show me what acceleration can look like in just... Look at the entrance into the, into the airport today. Now, the Dubai airport is going to be the largest airport in the world in the next two years. Last year alone, they had 87 million people visit Dubai. This is a nation that has only three things, and you will read it in the book. They have sand, they have sea, and they have sun. Most people think that Dubai has oil. They have such negligible quantities of oil that they have on the border of their rich cousins called Abu Dhabi. I don't know whether you get what I'm trying to say. They don't even factor it in as one of their key resources. Let's go. So you can see the difference. What's this? Accelerate, isn't it? This is what their immigration used to look like. When you came in, they will welcome you and you can see all the beautiful decor that they have in their, in their, you know. Then if you then had anything to declare, they will send you to customs. Let's go to customs. And this is what customs looked like in Dubai up till 1979. And then all of a sudden, pff, accelerate. Let's go, let's go, let's go. My time is far spent. This is what their airport used to do like if you needed to take a plane and catch a flight, you would need to do something. Go to the next slide. Anybody knows anywhere in the world that they still go and board the plane? What? No, 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 no. I didn't ask you where. I just said, do you know? <laughs> All right. But today we see that this is just one of the smallest wings as it is in, in the Dubai airport. But let's go quickly so that we, we wrap this up. You can see this, this, this is the busiest road, the Sheikh Zayed Road. This was what it looked like in 1989. This is what it looked like in 2010. For us, you know, you can see the Al Maktoum Bridge, one way going, one way coming. Now, 20 years later, you can see it. It's six lanes going, six lanes coming. What do you call that? Accelerate. Let's go. You can see the Dubai Abra and the skyline. That's acceleration. Let's go. Can you see this? And it's not just Dubai that you can find the grace for acceleration. I'll show you another one. Very interesting one. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. This is a city that is what you call a waterfront nation. In a sense, it has access to the sea, but does not have any hinterland. Basically, this nation is, uh, was literally just the British camp for Malaysia. It is called Singapore. And this is what this country looked like in 1960. Now, I want you to take a look at this very clearly, because they took a shot from this same exact angle, less than 40 years later. Let's go, one. What do you call this? This is what happens when a nation, a generation of people understand their mandate. That they are not just called to be able to make more money, get promoted. They are called to build nations. That every man has a calling and your generation is supposed to leave a better nation for your children than the one you inherited from your parents. This is the call to man. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, you begin to see that God set man in the garden of Eden, not for the sake of man, but for the sake of the garden. In a sense, you were put in Nigeria, not for your sake, not because you needed to get some kind of job. It wasn't so that you could get a house. It wasn't so that you could travel from time to time. You were put here to dress Nigeria, to keep Nigeria, to, to, to guard Nigeria, to cultivate. Those are the different words that the different versions of the Bible use in Genesis 2 and verse 15. And when a generation of people come to understand that I am here for such a time as this for the sake of my nation, that this is a relay race. This is, this is me just doing what I have to do and leaving a better nation for, my, for the next generation. That we must leave a generation, a nation without generators. That we must leave uh, the next generation uh, light back in the bulbs and we must put water back in our taps. And we must put education back in our schools. And we must put health back in our hospitals. And we must make sure that we have safety on the road. And road safety is not the name of a commission. 
It's an experience that drivers should have. Does anybody feel me? This is what it is that we are called to do. But to be able to do it, each one of us must accelerate. Does anybody feel what I'm saying? You must run your race and fill your space and ensure that you do what you have to do. Tell somebody next to you, we are all depending on you. So when we talk about acceleration, I need you to please understand that this has nothing to do with just being able to buy a house quickly. This has nothing to do with being able to just buy a car quickly. I graduated and by God's grace, very, you know, I was able to find a job very quickly and uh, immediately after, in fact, they gave me a car loan and, then, uh, and, and now I, I have, I have a, mes- a Mercedes-Benz uh, M class. Praise the Lord. That's not a testimony. Your testimony shouldn't just be causing people to praise God. It should be causing people to fear God. People should see the hand of God move mountains. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices because they saw what the righteous did. It's not how quickly you can get a job that is your testimony. It's how quickly you can build a business that can provide jobs. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say. It's not whether you can build a company that is the big idea. Can you build an industry? Because we need to have a nation where your prosperity is secure. And the only way your prosperity can be secure is in the prosperity of others. Does anybody feel me? Tell somebody next to you, accelerate. No, say it this way. For God's sake, accelerate. Now, for God's sake, is not supposed to be some kind of expression. I'm telling you, you have to accelerate for the sake of God. Why? Because in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, God blessed man and to give evidence to the blessing, God insisted that man must accelerate. So he said, be fruitful. Somebody said, be fruitful. But God said, nah, don't stop there. Now multiply. Somebody say with me, multiply. God said, ah, 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 but don't stop there. He said, now fill the earth. Meaning, don't just stop there, nationalize, internationalize, regionalize, and for God's sake, globalize. And then he said, don't stop there. Make sure everywhere you are, you are replenishing that land and creating succession. See, every time I'm able to see these guys do marvelous things, Steve Harris, Bankole Williams, Peter Ogbonna, and all these wonderful people that I have had the privilege of being able to touch their lives, I feel like I have fulfilled God's purpose. Because when God calls you to be a leader, he didn't call you to be a lead, L-I-D. He called you to be able to raise people that will grow and do greater things than you. And the day you want to be the greatest one, know that you are no longer carrying the spirit of Christ. Because even Christ said, he that believeth upon me, the very things I do, shall he do. In fact, he said, I'm so sorry. Greater things shall you do. Somebody say greater things. My question is, who are you raising to be greater than you? Who are you raising to be greater than you? Be fruitful. Multiply. Replant. Globalize was not a good idea. It was an instruction. Why? Because God was saying, your growth is the only evidence that I truly blessed you. That's why every time you look at the place, the people who grew, you will find out that when other people testified about them, they said, and we have seen that God has blessed you. So Eliezer, the, 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 Eliezer, the, the, the man of God, um, who, who was the servant of Abraham, When he went to Rebekah's house, he started to testify concerning Abraham that the Lord has blessed my master and he has grown and become great. In in, in Genesis chapter 26, Isaac grew after God blessed him. Before God blessed him, it was only his seed that grew. So go and look at it. You see that in verse 12, and Isaac, and Isaac sowed in the same land and in the same year, what happened? 
He ripped a hundredfold, true or false? Now, that did not have anything to do with the blessing. That had to do with the law of God in Genesis chapter 11. When God made a promise to Noah, the growth of the seed was not the blessing. The semicolon that you'll find in that scripture tells you that, if you remember, in, in your English, semicolon is a conjugation, isn't it? And it joins two separate sentences. So you will see that the Bible says, and the man grew and he sowed in the land and he ripped a hundredfold, semicolon, and the Lord blessed him. So when you see that, and the Lord blessed him, it was a separate sentence from he ripped a hundredfold. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. But the moment you finish that statement, the next thing is that, and the man grew. Ask someone next to you, where is your evidence of blessing? Don't you understand that when you do not grow and you do not grow quickly, you are calling God a liar? It is not a good idea that you should explode in growth. It is an obligation. You owe it to God. You must grow. Tell somebody next to you, am I the only one that is angry at our slow growth in this nation? Tell someone next to you, you must grow. Tell somebody you must grow quickly. We don't have time. So how do you accelerate? Let me give you four key things that you must do to be able to accelerate quickly. Number one, if you're ever going to accelerate, there are four lanes that you must be able to travel on your path to change. The first one is called start. I need you to note these things down. It's going to be very easy. You're going to be able to remember it, but don't take it for granted that you can remember it because what I need you to do is a real exercise when you get home tonight. The first thing you need to do is start. You're going to ask yourself, what am I currently not doing that I need to start doing to make a change in my life? And I'm going to tell you seven key areas that you'll find change. The next one is stop. What am I currently doing that is slowing my growth down? The next one is more. What is it that I am doing that is good? I just need to do a bit more of it. And the last one is less. What is it that I can't stop doing? I don't have to stop doing. I just need to do less of it. I can't stop eating, but I may need to eat less portions. Does somebody understand what I'm saying? I may need to spend less time in front of the TV because I have found out that the people who sit in front of the TV can't be found on TV. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. I found out that the people that are on TV don't sit in front of it. They sit in front of a camera. So when you sit in front of the camera, you will be found on TV. But something has to be worthy of capture for a camera to find you out. I don't know. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Tell somebody in front of you, get off before that TV. Some of us are spending too much time before we go to sleep. And therefore, we are waking up too late instead of catching the wisdom of the night. You want to get the secrets of the great ones? Most of them are awake between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. True? But now let me quickly give it to you. So somebody say with me, start. Stop. Say with me, stop. stop. Say with me, more. more. Say with me, less. Those people that will accelerate between now and next year will do these things I'm telling you to do tonight, not tomorrow. They will do this analysis, but I want to show you seven areas that they're going to do it. I have just about three minutes more. Let's go, quickly. Next slide, please. All right? Number one, you are going to have to understand that you are a person who has seven key areas to your life's dimensions. And so if you're going to have accelerated growth, you must see change in each of these seven areas. Number one is your emotional dimension. Your emotional dimension is the place of your mind. And you're going to have to ask yourself, what must I start doing to grow my mind? What must I stop doing to grow my mind? What must I do more of to grow my mind? And what must I do less of to grow my mind? 
One of the things that I found out about, about people who do amazing things growing their mind is that even in their leisure time, they are investing their time, not spending it. What do I mean? They spend their leisure time recreating, not relaxing. You know the word recreation is actually recreation, not recreation. Because most of us heard recreate. We don't know what recreate means. Or recreation. It's not recreation, it's recreation. Meaning God has created you, but you must recreate yourself. Yoruba say, I want to be a but olati tunre ebi. Bi abini, kotoka tunre nibi. Bi abini. You remember that song? Sonia Day? Okay, some of you are too saved for that. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You must ask yourself, even when I'm chilling, am I chilling, recreating, or am I chilling, relaxing? What does the word lax mean? What does the word lax mean? Got to finish it. Lax means to be loosened. To be loose. So when you finish relaxing, you are looser than when you went in. Meaning now you have to start warming yourself up to, to be able to run your, your race again. Do you understand what I'm saying? Tell the person next to you, what must I start? What must I stop? What must I do more of? And what must I do less of? You must have, for instance, less idle time. Let's go to the next one. Physical. Your body is the vehicle of your purpose. Your body is the vehicle of your purpose. Meaning that you have to ensure that your body is fit for purpose. Otherwise, you will have a great destiny in front of you and the engine would have knocked. Do you understand that the World Health Organization says that the average lifespan or life, uh, life expectancy of an average Nigerian man is 47 and a half years old? The average Nigerian marries at about the age of 35. Average. Meaning that by the time that some of them will die, if they're taking that average age, their children may be just about 10, 11, which is about the time that your father, your child needs you more than any time. Do you know that any business that is started by a man that has not yet gone from 15 to 20 years is not likely to survive the death of the founder? Do you know that any organization that you have not done possibly 15 to 20 years of, you are not likely to get a proper gratuity and pension upon the death of the staff? Most times they will pay the family enough to be able to bury that staff. Any man that dies at 47 is likely to have something in the region of a 38, maybe 40-year-old widow. That is the prime of every woman. That is the time her libido is on full, is on full blast. And now you are denying her the love, the comfort, and the nurturing of a husband because you couldn't manage your body well. Put too much, too much stuff into that thing. Too much cholesterol, too much salt, too much oil, too much sugar. And now the stomach has become a mountain. And that is how we know that you're a big man. Because you eat late at night. And when they now want to help you and make you feel like truly you are the one, you are the great I am. So they put seven mountains of, of Pomo, Bokoto and all of those things in front of you. To be able to tell you, you are the guy. <laughs> As you are careful, you go, go easy. <laughs> and as you are loading up your stomach, your heart is being put under pressure. Tell somebody, stop something here. Stop, stop eating late at night. Start eating more vegetables. Start exercising. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Many of you can't clap for me because you don't want to do it. I need you to be alive. When your children's children are here, you must be here to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Let me just go on because I don't have time. You're going to have to do start, stop, more and less for your relationships. And the core of your relationship is your spouse, if you say husband or wife, 
And this one I need you to please ask your spouse, what should I start doing that will make you happy? What should I stop doing that will make you happy? What do I need to do more of? And what do I need to do less of? If you can ask that question tonight, get an honest answer if you are not a terrorist. <laughs> All right? And walk on that honest answer throughout this year. You will have eternal honeymoon. I promise you that. Just ask the question. That's all. Next go. Professional, which is your relationship with your career. There are things you need to start doing at work. There needs to be things you need to stop doing at work. There are things you need to do more of at work and things you need to do less of. Can I have an agreement here that as many as will raise their hands tonight will find some time tomorrow to go and ask their boss? We know it's not appraisal time, but what would you like me to start doing? What would you like me to stop doing? What would you like me to do more of? And what would you like me to do? These are Christian hands I'm talking about now. That's a hand of integrity. Anybody is going to do that? You're going to go and meet your boss tomorrow? Don't, don't wait till tomorrow. Just tomorrow. Some people can't try it. You, you don't want to do it. But how many people want to get a double promotion between now and end of next year? See your hand. I can promise you, if you brace the subject with your boss, your boss will take note that you are ready for a change. And once your boss sees that you are ready for a change, they will reward it. Let's go, last, second to the last one, finances. You want to see great acceleration in your life, you're going to have to ask yourself, what must I start doing? What must I stop doing? Sometimes it must be stop buying Gala and La Casera. Because if you think about the number of times you buy La Gala and La Casera, how much is Gala? I knew I, I know all the people that buy it. Do you understand? Do you, do you understand? You see, I, I, I got it. So the point being, if you calculate how much you spend in a year on Gala and La Casera, not to talk about some of the other things that you, you do with money. Do you know that many times your investment for your future business comes, but it doesn't announce itself? You need to stop acquiring as much or you need to acquire less liabilities and acquire more assets. What is an asset? An asset is anything you buy that makes you money. A liability is anything you buy that takes money away from you. So a liability takes money away from you to maintain itself. An asset brings money back to you to maintain you. I don't know whether you understand. That beautiful Christian Lobotin shoe, what is it called? Is that an asset or a liability? I'm sorry? Asset. Eh. Okay. You will tell me whether that shoe brings money for you if you are not. <laughs> it brings money. <laughs> okay. One of the most interesting things about most people is that they fake, they look rich, but many people are so poor they can't afford to die. Even if they tried, their banker will not let them. <laughs> I'm serious, guys. There was a particular man who, massive man, great man in this country, in this Lagos. Massive man, car dealer. I won't say much more than that if I get too close. The man was owing in 1997. He was owing First Bank 900 million naira. Then he had a cardiac arrest. The MD of First Bank got him on the plane and was speaking to him till they got there. You shall live. You shall not die. You shall live to declare the goodness of the Lord. They say. There are some people that are too... Listen, sometimes just being in debt guarantees your life. <laughs> All right, let, let's go on. The last one, uh, second to the last one, is, is societal. This is your relationship with your neighborhood, your society. Some of you just need to be a bit more involved in your, in your neighborhood. You just need to be a little bit more. I mean, let me ask you a very honest question if you will not be upset with me. Can I ask? If you were to live where you are living now, 
you are to leave, L-E-A-V-E, who will know that you have left? If you packed your load in the middle of the night <laughs> and you left, who will miss you? Who will say, I, I, I haven't, I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. A gentleman who was a banker, marketer, was trying to market someone, um, one of these big uh, public sector accounts in Abuja. Cut the long story short. They said to him, look, if you can meet the PA of this guy, this minister, you are done. That guy is the guy that takes all the decisions. So they say, okay. So the secretary called him on the says, that's the man coming there. Yes, sir. I've seen this guy before. I've seen this guy before. Anyway, stands up and goes to meet the guy and says, hello, sir. My name is... is, is uh, what do you mean your name is? Say, I, I, I know you. Say, of course you know me. And we live on the same block of flats. So it's just that you know your own. It's the only time we get to see you is when you are shouting on us that we should come and move our car. <coughs> the guy said, wow. Now that guy was a Man U fan. The PA was a Chelsea fan. Instantly, the next Chelsea match, the guy wore blue. <laughs> Went down to the guy's house. <laughs> Do you understand? You, tell somebody you need to connect. You need to add value to your neighborhood. You need to add value to Nigeria. I mean, if you were to leave Nigeria and get a green card and go to the U.S., will Nigeria know that you have gone? Will America know you have arrived? <laughs> Do, let, 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 me, let me quickly say this. And, and the value of a thing is measured by the absence that, by the vacuum that the absence of that thing creates. So, so the value you bring to your neighborhood is measured by the vacuum that your absence creates. If your, vacuum, your, your absence creates no vacuum, then your presence creates no value. If you leave this church, who will come and find you? And I know that they have a very good follow-up. But you know there are some people that even follow up is saying, praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Ah, she has left. Ushers are worshipping the Lord Greek big time. Ask the person next to you, are you adding value? The last thing I just want to share with you is your spiritual. If you're going to be able to translate and accelerate your life, it's going to have to be in the spiritual place. Ladies and gentlemen, it was the hand of God that caused Elijah to outrun the chariots of Ahab. What am I going to do more? What am I going to do less? What am I going to do, start to do? What am I going to stop doing? There are certain things that are going to drive you closer to the heart of God. God loves you, but does he know you? Does he know you? Does he know you? Ladies and gentlemen, understand that it is not everyone that God calls by name. In fact, Moses had to ask him, if I have found favor with you and if you know me by name. There are some people that God thinks of as a general part of a nation. The nation of. There are other people that God knows by numbers. He just says, and of the children of or sons of Issachar, there were two, 200 chiefs. Who are they? We don't know. And then there are some people that God knows them, but he calls them a certain man. Their name is not relevant. And then there are some people that he calls by name. And there's some people that are so great in his heart. It's not only his name. He calls them by the lineage. He will refer to their father, refer to their sons. I'm asking, what are you going to do? God said to me, your values are the things that will transform your life the most. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And he says, do not be conformed with the patterns of thinking of this world. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to test and test the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. God said it's all in the mind. Tell somebody it's all in the mind. If you're going to accelerate, you've got to accelerate first here. It's how you accelerate here that shows up in everything else. Don't forget that acceleration is fast-paced growth. 
And there are 10 things I just want to share with you. I'm not going to even bother to really explain them. Number one, if you're going to accelerate, you must make up your mind to make a positive impact on everyone you meet and everywhere you go. Say with me, I will make a positive impact on everyone I meet and everywhere I go. Meaning every time you meet someone, you must do or say something that causes them to say thank you. Nobody can meet you and their lives will remain the same. No matter how short that is. Make a habit of it. Number two, you must become a solution provider and not a part of the problem that needs to be solved. Somebody say with me, I will be a solution provider and not a part of the problem that needs to be solved. Number three, you must be a role model worthy of emulation. Very simple. Do everything you do, hoping that if every other Nigerian did the same thing, we will experience accelerated growth as a nation. God has spoken that by December 31, 2025, Nigeria will be undoubtedly the world's most desirable nation to live in. He has confirmed it through the mouth of many mighty prophets. Daddy Gio, Mama Idahosa, Reverend Sam, too many of them have said the same thing. 2025, God said 2025, God said 2025. If we're going to arrive at a most desirable nation to live in by 2025, we've got only 11 years, 6 months, and 13 days. Do you understand? We need to accelerate. And you must be a role model worthy of emulation. You must be your best in all you do, particularly the things you're naturally good at. Somebody say with me, I will be my best in all that I do, particularly the things I'm naturally good at. Next, you must do the right thing at all times, regardless of who is doing the wrong thing. Somebody say with me, I will do the right thing at all times, regardless of who is doing the wrong thing. Number six, you must value time and make the best use of it. Don't let a day pass you by without you working on your purpose. You came to the earth for a reason. You must fulfill that purpose. Number seven, you must care and show that you care through your words and your actions. To care means to be, to be concerned about the well-being of a thing, a place, or a person. Too many of us are saying, I don't care about Nigeria. And for this reason, you are put here. You're missing the point. Somebody say with me, I will consciously build a great legacy starting now, today, and every day. Number nine, I will live a life of integrity and honor. A gentleman once said to me, FD, I slapped her because you, you know now, you, FD, you know, said I had told her to stop saying it. And she didn't hear me. She said it again. And I, I said to her, I said, look, dear, stop saying this thing. And, 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 and and, and she said it again. And I said to her, listen, if you say it again, I'm going to slap you. And, and then she said it again. And FD, you know I'm a man of, I'm, I'm a man of integrity. <laughs> I said, that is not integrity. Because you also promised her that you will love and nurture and care for her. Did you tell her at the altar that you will slap her? So you broke your first promise. So it's one thing to keep your word. The second thing is, is, is it honorable? Let's go. The last one. I will make my family. Somebody say I will make my family. My nation. And my God proud. Is there anybody that would like to leave these values? If you, if you were to take these values and begin to leave them on a daily basis, do you think that your life will go up or come down? Oh, come on. Talk to me, people. Do you think your life will go up slowly or go up quickly? Do you think that your life will experience acceleration or not? So if I want to see the hands of those people who want it, because I have a little gift here, and with the permission of Pastor Godman, I would like to give you a little gift that helps you to keep these values in a way that you can recite them until you can retain them. Repetition enhances re retention. There must come a point in time when those values are no longer things on a piece of paper, they're things in your heart. There are things you can share with your family. There are things you can share with your kids. Every night, my children, when they say, surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life, and we shall 
you shall uh, abide in the house of the Lord forever. For amen. The next thing they say is, I am an ambassador of a generation that is empowered, motivated, and stirred to operate with natural excellence. And they begin to recite. And I just want to know, it's because repetition. Repetition. How many people understand that your children need values? Because we have come into a place where values have been so decadent, now we have a vacuum of values. True or false? Anybody needs this? A gentleman once said to me, this fella, this is a, the yellow card. It's an immunization card against the ills of this world as we have him today. Today, even if, you're, if you don't want to go after pornography, pornography is coming after you. True or false? You, it's almost like you need to hedge yourself around. Shut down things. Everybody today is shutting down Twitter. I don't want to go on Twitter anymore. Why? Even if you are not following something, they, somebody that you are following can retweet something. I need a place I can elevate my soul Where my mind and spirit can be whole Where the truth is real